Hi everybody and welcome. This is uh, Dr. Lefkoff here with an installment of Intermediate Microeconomic Theory and in this video segment we're going to uh, provide just an intuitive explanation for the solution to the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. Uh, so first off, uh, just recall that we had done quite a bit of work looking at the static version of this game okay, and you'll notice cosmetically things look just a little bit different here than they did on the first day we had looked at the situation where Bonnie and Clyde had tried to rob a bank and they had gotten caught and the DA had turned them against each other but just to convince you that these cosmetic differences don't really change the nature of the game notice each player has two strategies I've called them here C and D for cooperate and deviate respectively and certainly if you check uh, this is a game where deviate is the dominant strategy. It strictly dominates cooperate, not just for the road player, but also for the column player. Uh, so we do have this characteristic dominant strategy, Nash Equilibrium, and if you look even a little closer, you'll notice that uh, the Equilibrium is not actually Pareto efficient. So in that regard, this is exactly the prisoner's dilemma that we had looked at on day one, uh, however, with some slight cosmetic differences in terms of the actual utility numbers. Uh, so what we're going to do today is ask, hey, if these players were to actually not play this game just once, remember the static game assumed that these players met, they chose their strategies simultaneously, uh, they each received their payoffs, and then they, they never saw each other again. It was just a one-shot game. Okay, and today we're going to relax that assumption. We're going to say, hey, suppose these players meet, and they play this game over and over and over and over again uh, so that they can accumulate, uh, you can think, utility from playing the game repeatedly. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to repeat the static game. And essentially we want to know uh, whether or not game theory predicts as dismal an outcome for these players um, when they repeat the game, right? Because we know in the static game it predicts essentially a, you know, a breakdown of cooperation, that these guys are going to wind up in that inferior uh, equilibrium as opposed to the Pareto efficient situation where they each could have both been better off. Uh, so we want to know if we repeat the game, do we get as bad of a prediction? And as I said before, uh, these guys are going to be playing the game repeatedly over many, many rounds. Uh, so I want you to think of their payoff now as their total score accumulated across all the rounds. So if you want to, you can think of the utility values as dollars for now. And your objective as a player of the game is to accumulate as many dollars as you can across all the rounds of play. Okay, so we're going to consider the repeated gameplay uh, in this first video context, specifically in the context of a finite time horizon, uh, meaning all players know the game is going to end at some point and they all know exactly what that point will be. So in a sense, we're going to assume that the end of the game is common knowledge to all players. Now, this is not to be confused with what we're going to do in the next video segments, uh, which is to look at the infinite horizon case, uh, where players literally are either playing the game for an infinite number of periods, or maybe they're playing it for a finite number of periods, but nobody really knows exactly when the game will end. So there'll be some uncertainty to when the game is going to end, uh, and that's going to actually induce behavior as if. Uh, they are playing an Infinite Horizon game. So one key characteristic of the Infinite Horizon game that's much different than what we're going to look at next is that in the Infinite Horizon game, there's always going to be a future, meaning there's always potentially something I have to worry about happening down the line later if I do something shady today. Okay, so we're going to come back to this case in the, in the, um, the next few video segments, but for now, we're going to consider the first case of finite time horizon or a finite number of repetitions. So let's suppose... Uh, that we're going to play the static game just five times only repeatedly and what we want to do is get a prediction for what will happen in the sequence of play. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. We're going to play round one. Okay, row and column each choose a strategy. Those strategies are going to pick one of these four boxes uh, and then depending on which of those four boxes they're in, row and column get their payoffs and then that round is going to be set in stone. It's played, it's done, they can't go back. And then we go to round two. Same thing happens, row and column each choose a strategy, it puts them in one of the boxes, they collect the payoffs. Round two is set in stone, can't change it. They go to round three, they play round three, outcome of round three is determined. And they go to round four, same thing, outcome of round four is played, determined. And then last but not least, then they play the final round, round five. Uh, they choose their strategies again, and they get the payoff accordingly. And you can think their total payoff is gonna be just the sum of all the payoffs uh, that they've collected in each of the rounds. Okay, so we want to predict the outcome of this dynamic game and just like we had done for the sequential games we're going to use the backwards induction solution method. So, uh, so we're using backwards induction here just like we had done in the sequential game okay, which means we're going to start solving the game in the very last period. 
All right, and we're also going to be using a slightly different solution concept. Remember, with the static aim, we were using just Nash equilibrium as our solution concept. When we moved to the dynamic framework and we were dealing with a sequential game, uh, we saw that the equilibrium concept of Nash equilibrium changed a little bit. We had a special name for it called the subgame perfect uh, Nash equilibrium, and this is the concept that we had used. Um, to make predictions in the dynamic framework, but fundamentally it wasn't really that much different than the static Nash equilibrium, right? Um, in a sense that along the equilibrium path of the dynamic game, uh, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium had players playing mutual best responses in a way where nobody wanted to deviate. So in those two regards, it was no different than a regular Nash equilibrium in the static case. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, this is a dynamic game. Uh, it's not a sequential game, it's just a, we're repeating the static game over and over again, but since there are multiple periods, we're going to start solving this at the very end, just like we had done in the case of a sequential game where players took turns alternating moves. Okay, and uh, again, now we're using backwards induction here, so uh, rather than reasoning at the beginning, we're going to start at the end and solve the game tree backwards, just as we had done. Now, uh, I haven't drawn a game tree here. But hopefully you can imagine, you know, what, what a game tree would look like in this case. They played the static game once, and then the branches would lead them, you know, from whoever won the static game to another version of the same static game, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, let's invoke our solution method here using um, backwards induction and ask ourselves what would we expect to happen in the final round of play. Okay, now you'll notice, if you look at the final round of play, you ask, well, man, in the final round... Um, you know, rounds one through four have already been played. They've already been set in stone, which means it's as if I'm playing the game only one time, and we already know what happens when we play the game one time, right? In the fifth round, it's as if I'm playing the game just one more round, and that's just the static outcome, right? We would expect both players to choose D, play their dominant strategies, uh, and that would be the predicted outcome in the final period. Okay, so in the last round, this is key, in the last round, because there are no more rounds, and because all the previous rounds are set in stone, so to speak, players are playing the last round as if they're just playing the game a single time. Because right? all the previous rounds are, are already sunk. You've received those payoffs. You can't go back and change the past. Okay? Um, and we already can sort of exploit the fact that we know what happens when you play this game just one time statically. Right? Both players are going to deviate. They're going to play their dominant strategies. Okay? So for now, this is our prediction for playing the final round. Right. Um, so, so far, nothing really different than what we had predicted in the static game, except you now it's the same prediction is happening in the final round. So here's where we're at. Okay, so final round prediction is both guys are going to play D in the last round. Okay, so in a sense, now we can think of the final round as being determined. Right? I know what they're going to do at the end if they're rational. And I can ask myself, well, what would happen now in the, in the previous period? What about the fourth round, next to last round? Okay, so let's pull him up top here. Um, and hopefully you, you sort of start thinking and you realize, hey, the, the same exact logic is going to apply. Now that I know what he's going to do in the last round, and all the rounds previous are sort of set in stone in the sense that they're sunk, they've already been played, then really the fourth round um, I'm also going to treat as if I've played, you know, I'm playing the game only one more time, right? Because the fifth round is determined. I know what's going to happen there, which means the fourth round... I'm going to treat as if I'm only playing the game one more time. Uh, so there's only one more round to analyze, then we again can invoke uh, the solution to the static game. So the exact same logic applies here. Right? That means in the second to last round, it must be the case that all the players are going to deviate, given that we've reasoned that they'll deviate in the fourth round. So what's our prediction in the, uh, in the fourth round? This. We're going to expect them to deviate uh, just like the, we expected them to in the fifth round. Okay, so uh, what next? Well, you can just keep uh, keep applying this iteratively backwards. So now we ask, well, what happened in the third round? And hopefully you can argue, well, if the fourth and fifth round are determined now, and the first and second round have already been played, then it's as if I'm playing a third round once. And we know what happens if you're playing the game just one time, right? You're going to play the static outcome here uh, of, of uh, deviate, deviate. And same logic applies to the second round, and same logic applies to the uh, first round. All right, so you, hopefully you might be a little shocked at the result that we had just found here, uh, in that the model predicts that the players are going to deviate in every single round by playing DD. 
Okay, uh, this is the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium prediction when we repeat the prisoner's dilemma a finite number of times. All right, and, and just notice this is certainly not efficient. If I play this for five rounds and I get one utility each round, that means I've only collected five utility. Right, but if we had co just cooperated each round, we would have gotten five utility each round over five rounds, which means you could have accumulated 25 utility. Um, so certainly not efficient. Okay, so we're going to ask ourselves a question here. Right, we play this game only five rounds. Hopefully, you might think, well, if I played this game maybe a hundred rounds with somebody, surely we may we probably be able to sustain a better outcome than just deviation each time. Um, the next question is, well. Does game theory predict this? Does the equilibrium, if we were to extend our framework to 100 rounds instead of 5, predict anything different? Uh, and unfortunately, hopefully you're thinking, uh, or a little bit ahead of the game already, but unfortunately, uh, the answer here is, is going to be no. Uh, and the logic, again, is identical, right? Because if we're in the final round, if we're in the 100th round, and all previous 99 rounds have been played and the payoff's realized, uh, then the logic is the same. Right? If I'm in the last round, then I'm going to play the game as if I'm playing the game only one time. Okay? So it's, it's interesting that because there's a lack of any future after that final round, I'm, I'm really willing to deviate in that final round and playing the game as if I'm very short-sighted, as if I'm playing the game only once. Because um, right? all the previous rounds have already happened, they're fixed, I can't go back and change them. Okay, so if players expect deviation in the final round, which we argue that rationally they had better since we know how the, uh, the static game is reasoned, okay, then again, we can backwards induce that the same thing would happen in all the previous rounds, just like we had done in the five round case. Uh, so, let's discuss just the general prediction for the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. The general prediction is, if you were to play this game for a finite number of rounds, you know, five rounds, ten rounds, a hundred rounds, a million rounds, you know, no matter how many there are to be played, uh, the, the uh, game theoretic outcome here in the finite uh, case of the prisoner's dilemma is that the players will deviate and play DD within every period. And this is very, very inefficient. Okay, very inefficient. Okay, and again, this is the case regardless of how many rounds are played. Okay, so uh, you might say this results a little counterintuitive, right? If you played a million rounds, surely you would maybe do better than just winding up getting one in each period. Um, but you, you know, you want to ask yourself, what's the driving force between the somewhat counterintuitive result? Okay, and I'm going to make the argument here that probably if you would play this game a hundred times, I would hope that you could win at least a hundred dollars. Um, you know, again, if we were paying you one dollar per utility that you got, and maybe you allow the other person to, to win a few times and then try to get them to cooperate with you. And the idea is maybe cooperation in the long run might be more beneficial than trying to just compete with each other in the short run. Okay, but let's think about, you know, what is the driving force behind this very inefficient result that we're getting here. Okay, and what I'm going to make the argument now is that really the driving force of this game, uh, of really the prediction of this game, is, is what happens in the final round. Okay, that's really the driving force in the sense that after the final round, there's absolutely no future for either player to worry about, meaning if I do something crazy in the last round, I don't have to worry about retaliation from any of the other players, um, which means I'm likely to do something crazy if I want to. And so I want to just uh, you know, present an analogy here. Just imagine if the world was going to end tomorrow, you know, how would you behave today? I would argue that probably you do something a little bit different than what you do on a normal day. Right? If the world was going to end tomorrow, uh, you know, then you know there's not really any consequence of your actions because the world is not going to be around the next day, then your behavior today might be dramatically different. And that's really the driving force behind this result that we're getting is because the game is ending at some point in time, right? It's a finite game. It's ending at some point in time. Um, we're, we're getting this result that players are doing something very crazy in that last period. And because of that, we backwards induce that crazy behavior throughout the entire game tree. So... You ask, well, how will we maybe fix that? If I wanted to look at a dynamic framework where we could generate a result where players were playing in equilibrium that was not inefficient, okay, where players were maybe able to cooperate to some degree, okay, what would that framework have to look like? Well, it must have to look like a framework where there is no uh, situation where we run out of a future. 
right? So we would probably have to look at a framework where there's always a future to worry about, uh, which is why we're going to move to an infinite horizon framework very shortly and look at the game as we repeat it infinite number of rounds. Okay, so uh, here's the problem that we've established, right? That the source of the breakdown of any potential cooperation in the finite game is really a result of not having this perpetual future. Right, because in the last day, what do I do? World's going to end tomorrow. I'm going to try to steal everything for myself, enjoy myself while I can, and then not have to worry about the consequences. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to now model, we're going to move to this infinite horizon framework in the next set of video segments, and we're going to model the strategic interaction in a way such that there is always a future, meaning uh, if I deviate as a player of the game, I always have to worry about how people are going to retaliate. Okay, so keep in mind, this element was not present in the finite game using backwards induction because at some point there was no future. I never had to worry about the threat of retaliation. Okay, so we're going to consider this case in the next video segment where we extend the analysis to the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. And uh, hopefully this intuitive explanation was fairly clear. Uh, next video is going to be just a little bit more technical, but I'm still going to really try to focus on an intuitive uh, explanation of the uh, infinitely repeated case. So... We'll see you shortly.